and say, God, take a knife to my heart, do the surgery. I can't do this on my own. So one of the things we absolutely love about Mount Hope is this sense of relationship, right? That every single person matters. Okay, friendly church, yeah, we say hello and so forth, but it's not just because we wanna be nice. There is an actual depth that this set of relationships matters. Every single person matters. Sherry and I try real hard. I sit up here on stage and I look around the room and, and I, I try to know every single person in the room. Our elders do the same thing. So many folks, you guys, even the you know, pe- folks that are not in any kind of leadership role, working hard to know one another because you matter. You matter to God and therefore you also matter to us, right? So this is the heartbeat of this place. And days like yesterday, we kind of feel that, you know, we're getting to goof off with each other and, you know, you kind of roll up your sleeves together and you feel that sense of connectivity. But every Sunday morning, I hope you sense it in this room. When you step in this building, we pray for about 20 minutes before we open the doors. We're in here, a group of leaders praying. Uh, and, and one of the things we pray, God, don't let us miss anybody. Don't let anybody fall through the cracks. Don't let anybody be left behind because you matter that much. You matter to God that much, and therefore you matter to us. So let's turn our attention to the instructions in scripture about how to love other people and have them matter. You guys want to go there? Romans chapter 12. If you're using a Red Pew Bible, page 1123, get that ready. We're going to be there in a second. Not yet, guys. Go back. Uh, Blank slide. Um, So um, we'll get there in just a second. So Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to be this morning. All right. Now, uh, many of you know that uh, prior to being at Mount Hope, we came here, Sharon and I got here two and a half, almost three years ago now. Before getting here, I spent almost a decade working in the aviation industry and had a tremendous career working with recreational pilots pilots, private pilots, leading their outreach programs all over the United States. So it was a lot of fun. We got to hang out with pilots, go fly around, do cool stuff, be around airports and, and, and aviators and so forth. And we had a little bit of a joke in the industry that um, when you meet somebody, just, you know, out randomly, meet them in a restaurant or at work or whatever, how can you tell that someone is a pilot when you meet them? Do you know how you can tell? Oh, don't worry, they'll tell you. All right, there's a picture, I think, of me, right? So <laughs> forgive me bragging on this, right? It's a, it's a wonderful way of life, right? You get to leave the surface of the earth and come back, uh, you know, alive <laughs> is the plan, right? And uh, so, you know, really cool, heady stuff. When the girls were seniors in high school, you had already selected your college you're going to, and they had been recruited to play on the softball team. And wasn't it cool, Amanda, that we got to fly to a ball game and your coach was impressed. Your parents flew you in a private aircraft, right? It's, it's just really, it's really heady, right? It's really fun. Let me tell you about the day I almost died in an airplane. It was 2002. I had just received my private pilot's license, 2001. Had just, I don't know, a handful of hours as an actual licensed pilot. And it was one of those really gusty weekends, just like we had. You know, Friday, Saturday, remember how bumpy and gusty? Can you imagine flying? Actually, Sherry, you came home from Florida in that bumpy air, right, on Friday. So being a brand new pilot, I'm like, okay, I need to kind of learn how to do this in rough air. Cause you know, when you, when you fly for fun, you get to just choose when you do and don't fly, right? So I want to learn how to fly in the rough weather. So it was one of those really windy, gusty weekends. And so I rented, rented a little two seat airplane, which bounces around a lot and flew out to Winchester, Virginia to practice takeoffs and landings. And it's an, it's a uncontrolled airfield, meaning there's no air traffic control there. And so you just, everybody works it out. You have a little pad on your fly and you talk to each other on the radio and you do what you got to do to, you know, uh, manage each other's uh, presence. So you don't hit one another. So I'm having the time of my life. I'm the, only guy out, I'm the only guy out there dumb enough to be flying in this weather in a little airplane. And as I'm, I'm about to turn final to land on like, I don't know, trip, trip number 12 around the pattern, I hear a guy calling and he says he's six miles out flying straight in. I'm thinking, no, no big deal. I'll just turn and, and I'm, a, I'm way ahead of him. So I turn final and I'm doing my thing and so forth. And then hit that next picture, Gwen. So about this close to the runway, now it's not the picture of the actual day, it t- took us another day, about this close to the runway, you see I'm only about a quarter mile from the runway, only about 200 feet off the ground, it's bouncing around, thank God, this bolt of turbulence kicked the airplane and right out of the corner of my eye, there's that other guy 20 feet below me. We are simultaneously tracking for the same runway. Guess what would have happened? 
I would not be your preacher. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I, <laughs> somebody over there said, amen. <laughs> it's a thing that we say in aviation and we say it in other parts of life. It's called confirmation bias. You hear one thing, you want it to be true. You think one thing, you want it to be true. And all the other evidence suggests, even though it suggests it's not, you miss it. It gets you in a lot of trouble. My confirmation bias, when he said he's six miles out, I didn't see him. I didn't inquire. I didn't push. I just assumed he was six miles away and he obviously wasn't. So here's my question for you this morning, friends. The question that I think God would say to me, to say to you. Do you think, do I think, do we think we are properly positioned relationally with everyone we know? Stop and think about the relationships you have, the people you interact with. Do you think you are properly positioned with them? And I think this morning we're going to see in scripture, God may say to us, you might need to change your mind. The confirmation bias that we all have, we're all trying to be good people, right? Anybody here intentionally trying to be a jerk? Can I see your hand? <laughs> I know you're teasing Sarah Jane. You're not, people, John, are you trying to be a jerk? All right, so most of us, only two in the room <laughs> owning it, right? All the, no, most of us, we want to be good people, right? Nobody wants to be hated. So you try to be nice. We try to be properly positioned. But have you noticed human beings? We're not doing so good as a, as a, as a collective, right? How much friction exists among people who really do want to love one another well. So we think we're positioned. We, we have this bias. Our culture has taught us a certain way to relate to other people. And the more important the relationship becomes, the closer the relationship becomes, the more intense the relationship becomes, the harder and harder it is to relate well, right? And we think we're positioned properly. And God might say, Look out the corner of your eye, right there. There's an impending collision with another person. You might need to change your mind. So you ready? Got Romans 12 open? All right, Romans 12, one. Here's where it begins. Paul said, and by the way, we're gonna read this entire chapter slowly, carefully. There'll be a lot of scripture this morning, but here's, here's why we do this here at this church. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation to you and I, spoken through imperfect human beings, profoundly imperfect human beings. As they wrote about their experiences with God, God was anointing it. So we're gonna cherish every single word here as an instruction, a guidance, a revelation for you and I. Here goes, Romans chapter one, or chapter 12, verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, sisters, in view of God's mercy. Now, hang on there. There's a therefore. We unpacked this last week. It harkens back to the first 13 weeks we've done together, walking through the book of Romans. If you're new around here, you can check it out on our YouTube channel. We've been going through the book of Romans now for, for we're now on 15 weeks into this thing. And when Paul here in chapter 12, he's turning the corner to give us very practical instructions about life and relationships. And as he's doing that, he harkens back to everything we've learned thus far. We've learned in chapter one of Romans that you and I, uh, when we, when we, when we uh, prioritize human beings and human relationships, when we prioritize that, that we will, by nature, we will become humanistic. We will ignore God and we'll think about our relationships and our circumstances in human terms. But God sets us free from that. Romans 3 tells us that God is the one who makes the first move. He's the one who establishes righteousness and justice within us by his own action. So in Romans chapter 6, he tells us, you and I can be set free from this bondage you and I have to, to slavery, this slavery of sin, this brokenness, this bondedness to continually doing wrong. And then Romans 8 tells us that when we step into that space, no condemnation, absolute freedom. You and I can walk a brand new resurrected life. That is God's mercy. Human beings who ignore God, make a mess of our lives. God steps in and solves it for us, sets us free so we can live a brand new life. That's good news, is it not? And so therefore, in view of that, Therefore, with that vision of God's merciful behavior towards you and me, then what does he say? Latter part of verse one, offer your bodies, your flesh, your cells, 
offer everything of you to God as living sacrifices. Holy, which means to be set apart for God, pleasing to God. And he says, this is your spiritual act of worship. We learned last week, spiritual meaning. You're very well thought through. You're very well reasoned act of giving yourself back to God. Verse two, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then when you do, when, when, you, when you choose to no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world, the Greek word there that Paul's writing, the word eon, you've heard of that, it's like the era. Don't be, don't be conformed to the way things are these days in our culture. Don't, don't conform yourself to that, but rather let your mind be renewed. And when it is, then, then you are able to test, approve, or discern, or distinguish what God's perfect will is, his good, pleasing, perfect will. Verse three, for the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself a sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Verse four, just as each one of us has a physical body, one body, but it has many members. You know, you got your, we look at you and we see you, we see your body, but you've got arms and legs and fingers and toes and hair and eyeballs and noses and other unmentionables, right? And you got all that going on. One body, many, many members. And as these members do not all have the same function, your fingers do not do what your toes do. They kind of look similar. Your toes are a little stubbier, right? But they don't have the same function. So it is with Christ. We who are many form one body. There's a lot of individuals in this room. A lot of individual perspectives and ideas and interests and attitudes and worldviews and cultures and backgrounds and love the diversity that is represented in this place of so many different people from so many different walks of life. Beautiful, but we're not individual people. We are, just like your finger is individual from your thumb and your, your toes are individual from your stomach and they have different functions at different parts, but so it is in the body of Christ that we who are many, we form one singular body. If I were to chop your finger off, your whole body is going to be affected, correct? Right, so we're one body and look at this, each member belongs to all the others. Huh. Now we each have different gifts according to the grace that God has given to us. If a man's gift or a woman's gift is prophesying, or in other words, proclaiming God's truth, well then let him use it in proportion to his faith. Speak up at the level of your faith. Verse seven, if your gift is serving, well then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of the others, well then give generously. If it's leadership, govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, do it cheerfully. So in other words, What's the part you play? You're not, you're not in this world. I'm not in this world just for yourself. This isn't about just making life the way you want it to be and navigating through life and doing your own thing. It's, there's actually a place we have been given in a broader body of relationships. So what's your part? Now, let's slow down carefully. We're gonna read these next few verses really slow and contemplate them oh so carefully, friends. Verse nine, love must be sincere. Why would he say that? Isn't love naturally sincere or is there a tendency we have to love with an agenda? Love with something we get in return. Hate what is evil, but cling to what is good. We hate evil that we see in other people, do we not? We're pretty good at that part. Do we hate the evil we might see in ourselves? And I know you have some, don't you? You can leave me hanging, am I the only one in the room? <laughs> you already raised your hand, Sarah Jane. You're already, you've already established honesty for us this morning. That's good, that's good. Are y'all okay, by the way? Are you feeling yelled at? Not by me, this is, we're, we're in this together, folks. <laughs> like, you know, 
chief sinner in the room right up here, y'all. Just give me the badge. Let's go. All right, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. Huh? I'm not so good at that one, are you? Faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. That's when people around us we don't know, maybe we don't like, but I'm going to step towards them. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Hold the phone, y'all. Are you kidding me? Do you know what persecution is? Do you know the context, the Apostle Paul, when he writes this? Anybody know who he wrote this letter to? The Romans? I mean, all right, this was not a trick question. <laughs> the book of Romans was written to Romans who were busy sharpening an ax that would be dropped across his neck. This is, this is the world that Paul was living in, right? That Christians were persecuted. Paul, by the way, had started that. He was, before he became a Christian, he did a lot of persecuting himself of other people. But, but in the context, can you imagine that? Oh, wait a minute. Jesus did the same thing, didn't he? That while being executed on a Roman cross, the words coming out of Jesus' mouth, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. The other guys crucified either side of him. They were full of cursing and swearing and yelling, which is probably what I would be doing if I had spikes through my wrist and this, this was the end, wouldn't you? But Jesus' response, bless, bless, bless. Father, bless them. Are you still having fun? Let's keep reading. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, be willing to associate with people of low position, do not be conceited. Verse 17, do not repay evil, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And if it is possible, as, it fa as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Think about this. Now we're getting deep in the weeds of people who have done some tremendously painful things to us. And I know looking across a room this size, there are plenty of people in our lives that have profoundly wounded us. Some of you have former spouses that betrayed you and stabbed you in the heart. Some of you have coworkers that have uh, undermined you and gotten you in trouble at work or stolen a promotion from you or so forth. Some of you have neighbors who have done awful things to you. I got a list. I've got a list of people in my life who have done some tremendously difficult things, painful things, wretched things. And it's human instinct, right? It's human nature to want to get back at them. Whether it be passive aggressively or subtly or, you know, kind of repay the evil with evil, right? Just to kind of, well, hey, they did it to me, so I'm doing it to them. What's good for the goose, good for the gander. Anybody thought that, right? But God says here, hang on. Yes, justice in you wants them to get made right. Justice wants them to get caught for what they're doing wrong. Justice in you wants them to pay, right? And God says, Give me some room. This is my responsibility to deal with them. His instruction to you, to me, is back off. Let that awful human being that, you, that has done tremendous damage to you back away. Give me the space to do what I need to do in their life. Do you see that? Verse 20 is going to be the hardest. Got your seatbelts fastened? Here it is. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. 
And in doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. I'll explain what that means in a moment. This isn't natural, is it? Someone you consider, I mean, he's outright lining up, defining them, lining them up as your enemy. And he's saying, bring him dinner. Wow. And he concludes, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil. In other words, what he's saying is the patterns of this world that are so unlike this actually are in fact evil. The opposite of these things are in fact evil. So don't be overcome with it. Rather, step into the space of evil and brokenness in human relationships and, be, and overcome that evil with doing good. Whew. All right, now can I ask you, are you having any fun? Are you glad you came, you came to church this morning thinking, Chris, it's really sunny outside. We could have gone hiking instead. Well, all right, friends. Let's, let's square up on this. Remember, it all started with therefore. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, here's the instruction. Beloved, we cannot do this without God's mercy, right? This is impossible. This teaching, this stuff is not unfamiliar to you. If you've been around any church, any religious before, you've been told you're supposed to love each other, forgive each other, be kind to one another. Some of you are about to fall asleep because you've heard this over and over again. Yeah, okay, just, you know, all right, be a nice person. I know, I know, be a, be a nice person, right? You know this, right? But it is intensely impossible, isn't it? I mean, what he's asked here, come on, let's be honest. Can, can you really do any of this? Uh, I mean, really? It's impossible in our own strength. We can't do this. It's supernatural. This, he's asking for something profoundly supernatural. Now, because we, it's familiar to us, okay, I'm supposed to be a nice person. Don't be a jerk. Actually, uh, I had a guy at work, uh, my, at my former job in the aviation industry, a corporate uh, gig, and he and I were, we were friends, but we were as far as the east is from the west in terms of worldview and philosophy. He used to pick on me all the time because he knew I was a religious guy. He even spray painted a parking space where I attended park he spray painted pastor in front of it to embarrass me and you know he would poke at me in meetings and all that but we actually we were good friends and uh you know we would talk and and uh you know i'd try to share faith and he'd just look at me and grin and he goes here's what i think all religions boil down to don't be a and he don't be a jerk is the polite way to say it but he used a curse word just don't that's what religion is right you're not you're not unfamiliar with this but because it's so impossible for us, what you and I tend to do is we'll read stuff like this, like, okay, yeah, I heard that before. And then we just kind of water it down and do our own version of it. We take, we pick and choose little pieces of it and we do the best we can. But the intensity of what God is calling us to, we kind of leave lay aside and say, well, I measure myself against the rest of culture and I'm a little nicer than everybody else. I'm a little nicer than that jerk at work. I'm a, little, I'm a little better than that spouse who dumped me. I'm a little better than that guy who, you know, threw dog poo on my lawn or whatever it was he did, right? <laughs> that actually happened to me. That's why it came to my mind, <laughs> literally. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm better than them. So, I mean, come on, God, this is, this is a little much. Feed my enemies, are you kidding me? Do you see it? According to the revelation of God, not conforming to the pattern of this world, this eon, this age, includes, verse 5, that each of us belong to the other. That's not what American culture teaches, is it? American culture teaches you're yourself, be your own person, be your own man, be your own woman, right? Uh, property, private property, all that kind of stuff. But, the, but God's revelation says we belong to each other. Like, actually, I belong to you. It, not conforming to the pattern of this world includes verse 10, that we are to honor others above ourselves. Whew. Like, you're more important than me. You matter more than I matter. What is it you need? What is it I need? Folks, try this out in marriage. You know, most marriage conflicts 
or a gap in, I need something my spouse is not providing for me. And it may be very legitimate. It may honestly be there's something you really need. There's an emotional connection you really need that they're not capable of. There's a relational, they need to probably treat you kinder or whatever it is. It may be very real. There's something that you are not having your need met. And the word of God, the revelation of God says, well, honor her first, way above yourself. Honor him first, way above yourself. Try that. That's the revelation of God to us. It also includes, verse 14, that we are to bless those who do us harm. Whew, this is not easy. Somebody's hurt me. I'm supposed to bless them? I mean, what, in the, what in the world does that mean? The world doesn't do this, but the scriptures, God's revelation calls us to. Verse 16, that we are to associate with people who are unlike us. Can I grab a third rail and electrocute myself real quick? This includes the person who votes opposite of you in politics. Our culture, I've noticed it on Facebook. Some of, I've seen some of you put this on Facebook. I just can't be friends. Any, how many, I'm not gonna, no, no show of hands. But I've seen people like make this announcement on Facebook. I'm purging my Facebook friends, right? And, Okay, well, I'm still here apparently. <laughs> How about people that you just absolutely cannot understand their worldview? How in the world could you think that? Well, God's revelation is hang out with them, be their friend, inquire of them. If you honor them above yourself, you might actually learn why they think what they think that's driving you bad and you want to pull your hair. You can do what? You can say what? what? Well, spend some time with me. Maybe you'll understand. Right? Amen. Rod's having fun. How about the rest of you guys? Thank you, Rod. I needed that. Give me, give me an amen. All right. Verse 17. It also, the revelation of God is to repay evil only with righteousness. Only with that which is right. And he even says, verse 17, that which should be viewed right by everybody. That everybody could look at you and go, wow, you did nothing wrong in that in that exchange. <laughs> I almost biffed it in an airplane when I was certain I was in the right position. I was certain I had the right of way. Cool, I might have actually had the right of way. But, but it wouldn't have mattered. Catastrophe awaited because I wasn't properly aligned. So friends, you, me, are we sure, are we sure that our response to that evil is correct, that it's right? Not by what other human beings would say, not by what the world standard would be, but by God's standard is our reaction right? And not living according to the pattern of this world, verse 20, includes providing for the needs Providing for the needs of our enemy. This eon, this present societal, cultural dynamic does not do this well. Am I right? There's a thing they call cancel culture. You ever heard of that one? Cancel culture demands conformity and alignment with what I think is right, or we can't be friends. That's, that's essentially what it means. And folks on both sides of the aisle are guilty of this. Folks all over, it says that if we are not in perfect conformity, perfect alignment, we cannot be in relationship. And friends, for any believer, any Christ follower, I'm gonna get really strong here. The word of God reveals to us, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And for any Christian, any believer who adopts that mindset and lives by that eon, by that concept, uh, that, that we, we are, it's impossible for us to be truly a living sacrifice according to scripture, to live as Jesus would live. Because here's what, what the apostle Paul reveals in Philippians chapter two, that our attitude, your attitude, my attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. 
who though he was, he was actually God himself, didn't consider that divinity something to hang on to, but he would rather empty himself and come down and serve people who were sinners. John chapter 13, Jesus is washing his feet. The king of the universe, stooping down to the lowest, um, the lowest servant position, washing his disciples' feet. And when he gets done with that, he stands up, he says, do you see what I've done for you? I, your Lord and master have served you. So you should go and do likewise. This is what Jesus is teaching us. If you want to follow Jesus Christ, catch it. If I want to follow Jesus, if you want to follow Jesus, the concept of cancel culture, the concept of distancing one another from people who harm us or hurt us or opposite of us, if we distance ourselves from them, that is not Jesus. <laughs> Verse 20, let's look at that again, um, where he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Now, frankly, that doesn't sound very fun, does it? Anybody want burning coals put on your head? Teenagers tonight, they're having a fire pit tonight, fire pit worship tonight, teens. Um, and so there are going to be some hot coals here. We could dump them on somebody's head, see how it goes, right? Uh, parents, you're probably not going to let us have your teens tonight, are you? All right, so here's what he's referring to. It's a quote, it's a direct quote. See it in blue there? It's a direct quote from Proverbs 25, 22. And, and likely what the writer of Proverbs is referring to is what's called an Egyptian expiation ritual. I know you've never heard the, the word expiation. Neither had I, I had to look it up. Here's what expiation means. It means the making of amends and reparations. So here in Egyptian culture, very nearby where Proverbs was written, they had this ritual that when someone did something really bad, they stole something, something, they ruined somebody's life, they maybe murdered somebody, uh, and they want to come, they want to make it right, they want to make amends, there would be this ritual of repentance where they would take a big a bronze basin filled with burning coals and carry it around on their head as a symbol of their grief that I had wronged you. And it was, it was a, for them, a beautiful ceremony that would then lead the family that had been wronged would embrace them and, and, and things would be made right. Now notice, when the scriptures pull this story in, this idea of burning coals on your head, notice what the Proverbs tells us, and Paul repeats it in Romans 12, that if your enemy is hungry and you feed him, you, if he's thirsty and you give him drink, it will heap burning coals on his head. In other words, when we treat our enemy with kindness, here's what happens. They want to change. They are moved. Our kindness moves them to repentance so they'll pick up their bowl of burning coals and make it right with you. Oh, I thought yelling at them and screaming at them and cursing was what was going to correct them. That they were all of a sudden going to want to you know, correct their behavior when I freak out on them. I thought when I stabbed them back, they did something wrong to me. I do something wrong in return. That all, oh, they're going to see their ways. They'll learn their ways. And they'll, they'll no. God's revealing to us the exact opposite. And it's the character of God. The scripture says that it is his kindness. It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. God loves on you and me. He reaches out to you and me. And that's what makes us want to turn and, and, and follow him, right? So when you feed your enemy, when you serve the one who's done you wrong, you are leading them to a place of repentance. That is good news, is it not? Let me give you an example. I don't know if you pay attention to history or not, but tomorrow is the 159th anniversary from when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in our country. So I was listening to a podcast this week and it was talking about really the last couple of weeks of his life. You know, the Civil War was coming to an end. Uh, Robert E. Lee uh, surrendered uh, the Confederate Army to the Union Army uh, just about a week before Lincoln was assassinated. And as you can imagine, those days were incredibly tearing. Uh, family members, uh, brothers, uh, cousins fighting against each other. The whole nation was torn in two, right? If you paid attention to history, it's really awful stuff went on during the Civil War. Horrific things. And it was obvious the war was coming to an end. And right there in that last couple weeks, as Lee is surrendering and, 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 and Abraham Lincoln is having a conversation with Edwin Stanton, who's the secretary of war, the man who has prosecuted this war from the union side and all the atrocities they've had to wrestle through. And Lincoln and Stanton were having the conversation about, okay, we're wrapping up this war. Now what? And Edward Stanton, who was the secretary of war in our parlance today, secretary of defense, 
and he was pressing Lincoln. Let's round up every one of those Confederate rebels, those people who are traitors, those treasonous people, and do what every other nation has ever done with rebellion and treason, and let's hang them. I mean, that's what you do to treasonous people. It's in our law. Treason is a capital crime, right? And Lincoln's response, according to his podcast, I tried to find the source, couldn't find it, so I'm trust the podcast here. Lincoln's response, if we execute them, this war will never end. And he didn't mean that the Union wasn't going to win. They had already won. Confederacy had collapsed. But he said, if we kill these people, if we hang them, in the hearts of our people, this anger, this hatred goes on for centuries. Friends, did you know that in the United States of America, at the end of the American Civil War, is the only time in human history that I'm aware of where an entire segment of society rebelled, committed treason, killed, I think it was something like two million people got killed or wounded in that war at the hands of rebels. And it's the only time in human history when the government they rebelled against forgave them. Full stop. Abraham Lincoln was a Christ follower. And he spent the majority of his presidency on his knees in the Oval Office begging God for wisdom. And the scriptures reveal, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And he did. And this nation, for the most part, healed. So what am I supposed to do with this? This one was heavy, Sherry. I don't know if they're having fun or not. A couple of them said they were. Number one, let's do this right now. Take an honest inventory. Slow down. We're going to take just a couple minutes here. I don't want you just to hear a good sermon. I don't want you just to hear a, oh, guys, please don't hear your preacher yelling at you. This is me too. This is, this is us. This is hard. But take an honest inventory. Who are my enemies? Who are the people I dislike? Who in my life has done me harm? Who are they? Can you, can you visualize them? It can be something as you might, you might even think you're an enemy. It could be something as simple as a coworker, maybe an employee, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a kid. It, it, it's just not doing well by you. Who are they? Can you visualize them? And then ask God this question. It'll pop up on the screen. Ask God this. Next slide, guys. Gwen, yeah, there you go. What would you have, ask God this, what would you have me do to bless them, to honor them, and serve them? Like square up, look, look right in your, in your mind's eye at that person whom you dislike, who has done you harm, and ask, God, what would you have me do? to bless them, honor them, serve them. Now I need to give you two warnings. Number one, beware of this, beware. Do not re-engage the abuser. That is not what this teaching is. There are people who have been abusive in your life that a boundary does need to be drawn. Okay, so this is not a teaching to re-engage, but in those particular unique cases, the next step, ask God, ask the fellowship of the mature believers, how, do, how should we treat that situation? Don't, don't try to go that one alone, okay? But also beware, for most of us, those we consider our enemies are not, in fact, abusers. Now, some of you have been abused, and you know who you are, and you know it's legit. But for most of us, there's a tendency, because we know there's that, that obvious caveat, don't reinsert yourself into an abusive relationship, of course. But then a lot of us will look at just friction in a relationship and say, well, that's abusive. So don't mislabel that person, and therefore dodge your responsibility, my responsibility to bless, honor, and serve those whom we dislike. So let's go back to that point, take an honest inventory. Who are my enemies? Who do I dislike? Who has done me harm? And ask God, what would you have me do to bless them, honor them, serve them? 
Let's ask him right now. Like right now. Not when you go home. Let's ask him right now. So just close your eyes for a second. Get quiet before God. God, what would you have me do? And listen. Is he giving you anything? Is there a card you need to write? An email you need to send? A text you need to send? Somebody you need to go by their cubicle at work and just stop in and say, I'm sorry. Is there a family member you've been estranged from for years you need to reach back out to? Is there a, a spouse or child in your home or maybe a parent, an uncle, somebody that you've, you're close to but you've been at odds with that you need to say, God, help me bless this person. What is it you need to do for him? Is there somebody you need to invite over to dinner? Feed them. They'll be hungry at six o'clock tonight. God, what do you want us to do? So to look back at the screen, number two, next thing I can do with this, among those who are not my enemies, okay, there's other people in the world who aren't your enemies. Among those who are not my enemies, but they're just the average stranger or the acquaintance, the person I really don't have any interest in. Ask God. What would you have me do to bless them, honor them, serve them? Seeing a pattern here? Third thing we can do. Every day this week, this is the practical thing, this week, tomorrow, most of you are going back to work, you're going back to school. Every day this week, examine each of my interactions at work, at school, at community. Examine your actions at home, in your family. Who's around me? Even the people I love, people that, you know, people I love the most are people I often get in friction with the most, right? Because I'm around them the most. And ask God, what would you have me do to bless them, honor them, serve them? You do see the pattern here, right? John, Ryan, worship guys, you guys come on up. Friends, I love how quiet it is in this room and try to hold on to that space. I know we're getting distracted with folks moving around here. Hold that space. The reason it's quiet in here is because what we have just unpacked without any hesitation, we haven't tried to couch it. We haven't tried to, you know, massage it or dumb it down. We've just looked at God's revelation square in the face, eyeball to eyeball with God's word and said, all right, here's what it says. And the reason it's quiet, I would, say, I would guess, is because you know God's spirit, I believe, is speaking to you and to me. I know it, I feel it in my heart that this is truth, but it is impossible to do without God. So therefore, in view of God's mercy, present yourselves to God. Notice it's not, it doesn't say in view of God's mercy, be perfect. No, it, it says offer yourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Do you know what sacrifices do? They lay there and get sacrificed. Offer yourself to God right here and say, God, take a knife to my heart. Do the surgery. I can't do this on my own. I'm not capable of this on my own. I'm not a good enough man, not a good enough woman, not a good enough husband or father or, hu or wife or mother. I'm not a good enough friend. I'm not a good enough neighbor. I'm not capable of this. So God, here I am. I lay out before you, take your knife and get it done. And guess who he is? He is the way maker, the miracle worker who can do it. Do some business with God as we sing, and then I'll come back and pray us out. And God, that's what we're depending on. We're depending on you to be you, to be the miracle worker who can step into our space, step into our hearts that are filled with all kinds of relational confusion. God, step in and do the surgery. 
we surrender ourselves to you, God. We lay there before you and ask you, God, to do the surgical work to make us into your image, to make us as Jesus in every relationship we have. We give it to you, God. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.